All right, welcome everyone. My name is Nzinga Broussard, Senior Director of Impact Measurement at the Sorensen Impact Institute. I'm happy to be moderating this session. I'm gonna let the um, panelists introduce themselves, um, but let me just get started in terms of what I hope we can accomplish. It sounds okay? Is this better? How's, okay, so just how I hold it. All right. Um, I want to start with just some of the things that I hope we accomplish with this discussion. Um, so as the title of this session is um, worded, the, what is actually is the title, the future, is it the future? <laughs> Impact investing in Africa. I really wanted to get at the more than remittances, right? Um, and so one of the objectives of this, of this discussion is to be able to talk about how impact investing can complement the impact and the flows of remittances that has taken place on the continent, which has played a very, very important role in improving the lives of the poor on the continent. Um, we also want to talk about how impact investing in Africa um, can also introduce some opportunities to address the current climate crises. Um, so I think our panelists have a lot to say about that. And then I also want to talk about, um, we want to be able to gain some insights into um, the role that the diaspora has been playing um, in identifying and financing impactful endeavors on the continent and how the broader impact investing community um, can really scale that. And we've heard um, the usage of scale um, used quite a bit um, this morning. And so hopefully our panelists will be able to offer some insights on those three objectives. Um, so now I'd like our, our panelists to introduce themselves. Pedro, you want to start? Yes. Good afternoon. I'm Pedro Vasconcelos. I'm the manager of the financing facility for remittances at the International Fund for Agriculture Development, uh, UN agency. Uh, and, 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 and the only IFI, that's it. Hi everyone, my name is uh, Aloysius Atta. I'm the CEO of a company called PharmaLine Group. Uh, we are a digital marketplace uh, for 1.7 million small scale farmers. Uh, we've been around for a decade. Uh, we leverage digital tools to train farmers, finance them to grow food, and we help them to sell food. Thanks. Hello, everyone. I'm Maria. I'm the founding partner at OpenSea Ventures. We are a global fund, both this key with African, look across future of commerce, work, and health. We back operators, stun founders at the very early stage, so the first capital before they go out to fundraise. Um, and I've been an operator before I became an investor and very much have Africa as a core part of my thesis. Uh, my name is Iolua Boeji. Everyone calls me E. Um, I'm founding partner at the Fund for Africa's Future, also known as Future Africa. Um, we are uh, in first check investors into businesses that are turning Africa's biggest. We're, we're first check investors into um, businesses that are turning Africa's biggest challenges into global businesses. Um, we backed Andela. Um, which helped turn Africa's youth unemployment problem into a remote work opportunity. Um, we backed and also co-founded uh, Flutter Wave, which helped turn our financial inclusion challenge um, into a global payments opportunity. And uh, we also backed Move, uh, which is a business that turned our mobility challenges into a, mo a global mobility asset management business. Thank you and welcome. All right, so before we jump right into impact investing, Pedro, I want to start with you. Um, and so can you share with the audience the important role that remittances has already played on the continent? Yes, thank you. And, and I think that's a key question because of not only the title, but also the misconceptions that sometimes are, I think there's an echo, no? Or, ah, okay. Um, but before maybe saying remittances, is just maybe better understand migrant contributions to, to their home countries. And they can do that in many ways, with non-financial, financial and non-financial ways. On financial, it's remittances, uh, and, but it's also diaspora investment. So one uh, that I will explain in a second uh, is, has very different characteristics than, uh, than the other one. But also they contribute in, in non-financial aspects with the ideas, their knowledge, uh, that they 
be it as an entrepreneur, for instance, and I think we're going to be discussing this. But the long story short, they contribute in many ways. When you think about remittances, it's of course about the money, but it's about the people behind. We're talking about 1 billion people involved in this process globally. 200 million sending, you come across them. I'm, I'm sure in, there's actually some in this room. They don't even know that they were uh, remitters, but 200 million people are sending back to their home communities. And back there is 800 million people benefiting. That's how you get to 1 billion people uh, in, the, in the world benefiting and, and being involved in this process. It's $640 billion a year on the rise. Crisis free, with all the crises that happen, being security, health, etc., these flows continue to grow at least 10% uh, every year, and it's not going to stop. Most important thing is that half of that, I think, goes to rural areas where these flows basically count the most. And that's where I think it's important uh, that to understand. But these are $200 at a time. All the billions and trillions don't matter. So $5.4 billion, a trillion dollars will be sent by the end of this decade, mm -hmm. 2030. You've heard that agenda, the, the deadline of 2030, $5.4 trillion will be sent. But again, what matters is this $200 that you send back to your family. 75% of that 200 bucks is made to pay bills, put food on the table, education. And there's no, about, there's no discussion about grabbing that money elsewhere. But 25% is either saved or invested. And this is where the big opportunity on remittances come in by banking most of the people that receive these funds that are unbanked. This was the remittances. The other side of the question is, well, then what is diaspora investment? Well, is the other funds that the diaspora is also sending to their communities. They would like to invest back home. So after having supported your family with those $200, you also invest home, American entrepreneurial activities, and that's half a trillion dollars also in accumulated savings. Now, that connection is, I don't know about the echo, is it manageable? Yes, okay. The problem with that is that supply of demand from an investor back here. We were talking about a recent friend that you met at the, at, at the border control Nigerian that went to invest back home. Yeah. And, and basically, he's also in the premises. And he was asking questions about, how do I do it? I have the potential. I would like to invest. No one is helping. I would like more information. I would like vehicle. I would like supply and demand, in our case, supply and demand to be met. And this is, I think, what, what we will be discussing today and two concepts that need to really be differentiated when you hear remittances, fantastic opportunities. It's been happening for the last 30 years. Southern Europe benefits from that. A lot of banking has been happened through this. But diaspora investment is also another vehicle that, again, needs to be, needs to be promoted and, uh, and tapped. Maria, I want to go to you now, and, and Pedro touched a little bit on this. In what ways can impact investing play a different role than remittances, and in what ways can it complement it? Yeah, this is a great question. I guess maybe um, for context, I, 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 and I think this is the open seat view, I do think that the bifurcation of... Um, I think that this... right? <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I was saying that I do think that this division of what is impact and what is not, I think, in the world of the future, it should not be because I think thinking about your the sustainable um, impact of your fund, thinking about the environment, thinking about equity, should is no longer nice to have. I think it's an inevitable context. Okay. Can you all hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we do this. Okay. Yeah. So I was saying, I do think that that separation is no longer going to be relevant for the future. I think that. You know, gone are the days when you built businesses without any consideration of what that did to the environment, without any consideration to the equity, to the type of world you're building. I do think our value systems more globally is anchoring not just on the financial, you know, 
value, but then also how exactly does it impact the world? And I think that that presents an opportunity. Um, in the context of Africa, there are a few different things. I'm sure you've heard of the popular stats. You know, one out of five will be African in 2050. Median age is 18. But I think that um, there is a bit that no one's really talking about in the fact that the world will look different. Um, in the context of even broader, broader macro trends, I would talk about technology innovations, like AI, for example. I would talk about um, how we are innovating for a world that puts sustainability at the core of it. Um, I did lead a fund in Europe, an early stage fund, and I've also operated startups like Uber and Branch, and I've scaled startups locally in Africa, and I've seen global applications. I think that even from a funding perspective, there is an opportunity. There's the context of Africa as a silo, but I do think that there is relevance of, for Africa in the global world. If you think about value creation, it's comparative advantage. And I think for every civilization that has built prosperity for its people, you do have to think about what you can offer the world in context of how the world is going forward and trending and building that defensibility that creates value, that just creates leverage in, in, you know, as a result. So a few opportunities I do see is if you look at the greatest, I guess, emitters of CO2, it's the US, it's Europe, it's Asia. Africa is, I think, the least or one of the least of, of those um, of the emitters, but we are rapidly urbanizing. If you think about what that means for the future, there is opportunity for leadership and green leadership and thinking green first in how we build cities. Now that's more infrastructural. If you think about technologies, um, across the world, you are seeing chatter in, in terms of software that helps you track you know, how you manage your CO2, manage your waste implications. If you don't measure it, you don't mean it. Without technologies, we cannot evolve into a world that allows us to be a bit more sustainable. And I think that that presents an opportunity even for investments, for venture, for impact, whatever you want to call it. You will need to fund um, these innovations that help us track the data that help us build new infrastructure that allow us to think of the world a little differently. One specific example I'm beginning to see is just, let's say, just, and I know this is a little controversial, but like just carbon credits. I'm seeing carbon insurance. There's a whole new infrastructure for value that's being created, and the lowest emitters are not necessarily a part of the conversation. Yes, there's nuance to this, but I do think that there's a lot of innovation that we can create that creates this opportunity for strategic um, advantage for the continent. That's on one hand. OpenSeed really focuses on operators turned founders. I've scaled startups. I was the GM at Uber. I also led branch. I think that human capital within the context of Africa is one of the most under tapped opportunities. And I think if you think about just venture and high growth and building products that is relevant to the world, we now have a concentration of operators, Africans. Africans in diaspora who understand how high growth startups are built, how value is created, and can translate this in the local context and build value locally for Africa that can be even more relevant in the global stage. I do think that funding these people, um, I do think that providing the support that they need at that early stage can be very catalytic. So in my mind, I think rather than thinking, um, and, and I do believe that remittance plays its role, but I do think that beyond the volume of capital, we should also think about the type of capital. If you think about the impact of remittance companies um, in creating value to Africans if they were built locally, um, and you compare that, that side to side to just the remittance, I would say the 75% that kind of goes home to subsistence, subsistence, that's important. But if you think about the other, it's not just the capital, it's the human capital you know, development. People are at the startups learning how to build high growth startups. It's the generating of value locally. It's jobs. It's in, in improving livelihoods. It's also the knowledge. I'll give two examples of startups that I think are, are, are doing this um, in a very interesting way. Um, there's a startup that's recently built um, speech to text solutions for electrical medical records um, for doctors. Aside from the fact that that just makes things sustainable, because if you think about the local context, technology is still being adopted and you still have a lot of paper and manual base use, um, use for data records. Aside from that, there is a broader AI conversation and the world is literally, the digital world is literally being built without Africans in it. And they are generating data on African, the local context of African um, like language and, and, and also accent. Who's, who has an Alexa here? 
I have to Americanize so many words. <laughs> it's like, play see me. It's like, no, play see me. And then it's like, oh, I get that. But I think that there, and this is just one example. I think there are so many opportunities, not necessarily in the silo of Africa, but Africa's relevance in the g- emerging global world that is inevitable. So yeah, that would be my two cents to that. Cool. You touched on a number of things, and I just want to come back to... Um, Aloysius, maybe you can answer this. What role can impact investing play in tackling the current climate crisis? So you touched a little bit on it. Can you elaborate on on that a little bit more? Yeah, uh, thanks. About 19% of the greenhouse gases uh, that are emitted comes from how we grow food. And about 80% of that is from agriculture, 20% um, uh, from uh, deforestation. Although... Um, uh, although Africa and uh, like agriculture, in, uh, in, although Africa is a very small, uh, you know, you know, contributor to the impact of climate change, they are heavily impacted by it. When you look at the, uh, you know, if you look at how like funding is, uh, you know, climate funding is allocated, for every twelve dollar that is spent on mitigation, um, only one dollar goes to uh, adaptation. So there's a massive opportunity for government, um, private sector, the diaspora to invest in, in my view, uh, three areas to not only um, help people in rural areas and, and you know, people across the continent, people who are mostly impacted by uh, you know, climate change to only be you know, resilient, but then also to mitigate. The first thing is making sure that um, the decades of research that has been done on the tools, the technology, um, about how to farm, farm well and grow food well, the education should be um, democratized and made freely available to people who need it the most, more importantly, in the languages that they can understand. Um, today, when you look at where the content is, it's mostly online. It's mostly in books, it's mostly in PDF documents, and it's mostly in Western languages. Ghana alone has about 59 local languages. Um, in Nigeria has 200, and there are many more languages. And research shows that if you give content to people in a language that they understand, adoption actually increases. Right. So the first step is let's make sure um, everything that people need to do, farmers need to do, people in rural areas need to do to be resilient, but also mitigate their impact. Uh, is, you know, doesn't only end in you know these halls, you know these conference rooms, but it goes to them in the format that they understand. The second thing is um, the technology, the tools, the services has to be accessible to them. If you think about drought resistant seeds, they were invented 100 years ago, but adoption across the continent is still not very high, it's still very low. Um, organic fertilizer are the same way. Solar, solar irrigation, that actually gives the opportunity for farmers to farm all year round and not only depend on rainfall. All those technologies are already there, we know they work, but in the distribution, it's not uh, very high. There's massive room for government for private sector, the diaspora, to invest for impact, but then also for money returns. Um, and then finally, um, accelerating finance, making sure that those who need, uh, you know, people who are most affected actually get the resources to afford the services. Um, there are examples like the Green Climate Fund, uh, they just got replenished by about $9 billion or so. Are you, you guys yeah. part of that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. And they are leveraging that to um, work with the, the government, but then also the private sector to accelerate more financing. And there are many creative ways that that can happen, like invest in like companies and solutions um, that are, you know, deploying like, you know, digital, you know, technology to make like, you know, financing more accessible. Governments could come up with like, um, uh, you know, incentives for local financial institutions to invest. If you look at India, um, I think there's an allocation where you know, financial institutions in India must, must invest about 15% of their total portfolio into agriculture. Um, there's DEPA, where they are encouraging financial institutions to leverage alternative data sources to underwrite, like, like you know, small-scale farmers, to underwrite rural people, right? Just like how we have FICO here. Um, in most developing countries, people still de- uh, you know, uh, you know, depend on... Uh, collateral to invest. Um, there's room to invest in those tools and technologies to make sure financing is unleashed and, and accelerated to make sure that 
all the products that we know that work, make it, a, make it more affordable and accessible for people to use. So those are the three areas that I think impact investment can um, contribute or help the climate crisis. One, education. Two, distribution of services and products that we know that work. And three, financing to make sure they're actually affordable, that those who need it the most are able to get it and use it when they need it. Thanks. Thank you. E, the African diaspora has played an outsized role in investing in Africa, but also in developing innovations and solutions that aim to address many of the development challenges on the, on the continent. How important is it for the private sector to finance innovations developed by African entrepreneurs? Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, uh, you know, our, our point of view has always been that um, in, in Africa, every investment has an impact, right? Sometimes uh, impact can be positive and sometimes the impact can be negative. And on the whole, you know, the truth is a lot of the time, a lot of what is labeled impact investing doesn't always have a positive impact. And the challenge is, you know, how do we, in the midst of all of this and the labeling and everything, try to figure out what actually has a positive impact and how do we scale those investments that have a positive impact? Well, the one thing we've seen from the data is the fact that um, investments with a positive impact usually prioritize productivity and ultimately they're backed by the evidence of increasing income because that is sort of how the economics work, right? When people are more productive, incomes rise. Um, and I mean, just speaking more personally from our own experience uh, building Andela, we were four um, diaspora, but although I, it's a weird one to call us that because I only left for my country for five years <laughs> to go to school in Canada. So I don't know if that counts, I, uh, but uh, we came back home and but in the process of being outside the country, you know, we had partnered up with people from around the world who had a lot of expertise about education and scaling, edu scaling um, learning science and helping people learn things really, really fast. And that was how Andela was born. And that group worked very collaboratively to build um, and train over 100,000 technology leaders who saw a practical increase in income, you know, from zero dollars in many cases to over $100,000 over three years. And it's probably one of the most successful um, development programs that I can think about from an investment perspective, right? The amount of incomes and returns, both financially and otherwise, have eclipsed pretty much any other investment that I know of on the continent. And the question we have to be asking ourselves is, how do we get more outcomes like that? And I think it's gonna start by prioritizing um, investment, not just of money, which is what tends to be uh, the case. Everybody wants to throw money at Africa's problems. Um, but, you know, like I always say, money doesn't buy anything, right? It's knowledge that makes things and if there was a way for us to better organize um, our human capital around the world to actually be able to raise new talent in Africa, um, to be able to build solutions to the world's problems, not just Africa's problems, then we would actually be in a position to increase productivity and alongside that increase incomes. And that's ultimately when we start to get development because somebody who has increased income uh, can solve their own problems in the priority in which they choose to. They can choose to eat what they like. They can choose to get the health care they believe they need. Um, they can choose to meet the needs of the people around them. And so I think uh, in many ways, we got to start thinking about how do we um, leverage um, our diaspora to invest um, in human capital, not just uh, with their money, but with their time, 
um, and and help them to be able to increase incomes. And I'll just end with a practical point. You know, the U.S. today has uh, perhaps most of the doctors that were uh, trained in Nigeria and Ethiopia <laughs> over the last 20 years with public taxpayers' money from Nigeria, because I can guarantee you a lot of those schools are not priced what you pay here. Um, and we're talking about a health crisis in many of these countries. Um, if, if just a portion of the taxes that these doctors pay in the U.S. was put into a fund to improve um, health healthcare um, uh, training institutions on the continent, right? Everybody wins. America gets all the doctors and nurses they need, but then it doesn't have to be at the expense of our people back home. Um, and, and I think that if you apply that same model in every sector where a diaspora has had to leave the continent for better outcomes for themselves, uh, but unfortunately at the cost of better outcomes for society, um, you would actually be able to build a more sustainable model over time. And that would be a positive impact. I like that. I'm, I'm going to come back to the, the question that I asked, and anyone can, can um, answer this. But the question that I, I have is, do African entrepreneurs have a comparative advantage in coming up with innovations or solutions that um, affect the continent? Anyone? Yeah, I'm happy to go. I, I do think that the one thing that African entrepreneurs have is context. The context of Africa is very nuanced. And I think incredible things can happen when you have global knowledge on best practices, in quote, um, the talent networks, because no one solves anything alone, the heuristic on what makes high growth businesses or businesses that can unlock value at scale, like a systemic thinking business, I do think that there is some um, comparative advantage, and not just locally, because with these conversations, I think there's the temptation to think of Africa as a silo. It's not. The world is continuously evolving, and every country, every region has to figure out its relevance in the context of the new and developing world. We are having these conversations, sometimes I believe as though the world is static. Um, but it is evolving. And I think that the only people that can balance the global context with the local context, the global, I guess, skills, knowledge, trends, networks, but the local context are the, Af are the Africans themselves, in, in my mind. And I think that that creates some strategic um, advantage. The other thing I will say is that there's certain... I believe for every um, civilization, there is a point where you have a window for strategic opportunity. You can build comparative advantage. I think within Africa, we're coming up to a few windows. We have the human capital. We have the democratization of knowledge, of technologies. Even the emigration and the diaspora that is often painted as a somewhat negative thing. Yes, there are negative effects, but I think that there are certain skills, knowledge, um, insights that Africans are gathering of the global world that can now be put into context locally. Historically, and I do think you need a critical mass to do that because you can't do the th things alone. I'll give you an example. I am speaking with a startup who's building an infrastructure layer for the deployment of AI models, AI models locally in Africa. He is struggling with talent in terms of data scientists, to build a data, to build a model or an AI ML model. They are very specific skill sets in terms of the architecture, in terms of the mining, in terms of the insights on understanding data science and the insights that that brings into, into um, how you deploy the data. But if you have people who have been in these different contexts building solutions for global companies who can bring those talent networks and have the local context, imagine what could happen. And I think that we have several pockets of things where, yes, it's locally le relevant, but then it's globally relevant as well. My earlier example, AI, there's literally, to me, no other source of 
representative data beyond Africa for AI. We should be mining a lot of data to feed into the models that are shaping how people view the world through the AI models. I don't know how many of you have used AI models. If you use like um, your regular AI models and you ask for physical prompts, things like doctors, lawyers, it's hard to get a black person as a, as a prompt. You will, you know, contort to say black, it will not bring it up because that's the nature of AI models. They present what they're trained with. So I think that's just one example. And I think that we have several pockets of things like this where we are now at a point within Africa where there are opportunities to build globally relevant but also locally contextual solutions that actually ensures that we are in the conversation on the global landscape as well as opposed to just trying to solve the problems because they don't exist in isolation. Yeah, so that would be my comment on that. Thank you. Does anyone Can I have? share some thought? I actually disagree, sadly. You always disagree. Uh, <laughs> and I disagree because the reality of, 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 uh, of, of the situation is our entrepreneurs do not have any comparative advantage in solving our own problems. And that's primarily because, in many cases, um, they don't have the intellectual capital to do so, even if they have context. Um, and very much like Alois just mentioned, a lot of the problems we have are not rocket science. They are solved problems in other parts of the world. Now, if the question is, where do we have comparative advantage? Uh, and by the way, when I say we don't have comparative advantage, what I mean is not that African entrepreneurs cannot solve African problems. I'm just saying we don't do it better than anybody else in the world so that we're on the same page. But the thing that I think that we do, what is Africa's comparative advantage? It's still talent. It's still the fact that you have the largest number of young people in the world. Um, um, you know, if you consider the fact that we add 25 million people to our numbers every year, right? Um, and our median age is, is 18 for most of the continent. We still have the talent that can, that can build that comparative advantage over time. So if you think about it in terms of hours, man hours, um, especially with the accelerant that is intelligence and AI. Um, I think that we can accelerate a lot of the productivity. That's where our comparative advantage is, which is why I think ultimately Africa's comparative advantage is that it is the human in the loop. When you talk about artificial intelligence, you need a human in the loop at the back end and at the front end of the system, right? Um, it is the human in the loop. It has been the human in the loop in the back end. Companies like Samosaurus and Hugo and, and, uh, and um, Talent Factory and so many other companies built and organized all the models we use for AI today. And it created jobs and incomes while doing it. They were the human in the loop at the back. Now, perhaps there's a world where they can be the human in the loop in the front um, when you know, AI starts to be integrated into everything in the world, but there's still a need for some man-machine symbiosis that can guarantee that it's not being misused or it's being ethically made. And this is a, the global context for Africa's comparative advantage. But I think part of the problem is a lot of impact capital kind of comes at it with a moralistic, justice-driven point of view. So we want to make things that are not necessarily true, true. Um, or we end up in a hypocrisy where we dismiss them entirely. Meanwhile, the reality is a bit more nuanced. And that's why I said I didn't agree. We're not necessarily the best at solving our own problems. You want to challenge that? I'm not challenging, but just, just, just add a bit. <laughs> just, just, um, before you go, um, if you have questions on your cards, please send them up um, so we can definitely answer them. So I'll answer the question in two ways. Um, we don't have a lot of competitive advantage if we have to continue. Today, like all, you know, if you start a company, if you're trying to raise money, like there are not a lot of people like in your country that, are, that will invest money into a tech company. 
So you have to either come to America or go to, go to Europe, or mostly work with funds. Like in all the funds on the con in most of the funds that are on the continent are backed by you know they're not backed, backed by the government or private people on the continent. They are mostly backed by the DFIs in the family offices, and those are all good. But you know what that means is that the value system or what people people put premium on is also very different. Uh, I would say I would dare say it's not always African. It's not like African in code, right? You have to learn to understand and fit into all those value systems in order to attract the resources. And, and that just takes time. For us, it took us a, a decade to raise $20 million. And the path to that $20 million, meaning that I have to join really good fellowships like Echo and Green and learn how to talk the talk, learn the blueprint, speak the language, say what I do in eight words, like very quickly, uh, you know, 30 seconds. Like all those things are just ways that things work. That's fine. I'm not disputing all that. but. Um, we are the very like you know, we are privileged. There are many other young people who don't have access to this network, who who don't un understand the blueprint, um, and they don't understand the various value systems. So they are already you know, systematically at a like in, at a disadvantage. If they started business today, they'll have to go elsewhere. If they have to go elsewhere to raise the money, they'll face the same challenges. Um, and it, like for let me just give you a, like, one example. 2017, I was in Boston, fourth ten under thirty with. Like you know, pitching for half a million dollars from Rice Fund. Uh, Ghanaians are known to be very humble, so I went in my pitch deck. I'm like, I'm going to focus on the work, just like give numbers. And my friend, very good friend of mine from India, very close friend, Echo and Greenfellow from Boston, he knew the judges that okay, they are from the East Coast. He knew that you know, East Coast investor, you get you have to drop names, companies, mentors, coaches, people that you are affiliated. I didn't know. My company was the most advanced. I lost, and he's like, Aloysius, you didn't play the game. Right, so you know, if you look at it from that lens, you are we are at a disadvantage, but we don't have to cry about it. We can do something about it. Um, where we have the advantage is, we do have the advantage if we embrace what makes Africa great by looking into the past. Uh, if we and then also understanding the present. Let me start from the past. The past, learning about all the contributions that we've made, like Africans made a lot of contribution to architecture, to medicine science, taxation. For me, I draw a lot of strength from that. That gives me an advantage to design for the continent, to know that before the lines and the borders were drawn, we're already trading Nigeria, Togo. We're, all, you know, we're already trading with each other. We're already working. It's already like, and, and if you take it, like I draw from Togo, uh, Ghana to Benin, and we were speaking the same local language across the coast. When I came back, my company, we expanded very quickly because I knew that I didn't have to learn French to expand to Togo because they spoke my local language. I was, I'm from the eastern, of, the eastern part of Ghana. Just understanding that allowed my company to grow very quickly, just like in, you know, if you look into the past. But then also, when you're African, you also have some level of trust too in, in, in some cycles. And that trust can allow you to acquire talent quite quickly. That trust can allow you to do things cheaply than most people. What people put, some people may put risk on, you, you would see it as an opportunity. And that, if you embrace that, that could allow you to build a high value business. So, my, my answer is yes or no, yes and no. Um, yes, when you embrace the greatness in our DNA and in our history um, and the trust that exists around us, what makes Africa truly great, not just in this millennia, but like, you know, stuff that happened way before us, right? You know, our contributions to humanity. Um, if you go to Ethiopia, so much inspiration there. If you go to Egypt, the pyramid, like, you know, and all that. So for me, all those things give me a lot of inspiration. But today, the fact still remains that if you want to raise capital to build, like to scale across the continent, you have to pitch to institutions that mean well and are doing well, but they have value systems. Um, I would say the you know, the blueprint is not very common, and you have to learn the language. I remember one day, I have like a thousand examples. I was in Switzerland trying to pitch for an investment. Um, and I, like, I'm like, hey, I'm Aloysius from Pharma, like, from Pharma in Ghana. And then the first question is like, where is Ghana? Uh, and then do they build software there? Context. Right? Yeah. So like, uh, I'm like, okay, I'm not going to raise, like, there's no chance I'm going to get investment just because of where I have to start from. Right? Again, you can cry about it or you can do something about it. And I'm not crying about it. I'm just trying to point out like the facts as we have it today. A lot has changed, and a lot continues to change. Uh, but if things remain the way they are, like, we will continue to be at a disadvantage. Thanks.
did you want to take that or? I think it's going to connect with many things. So maybe okay. Question. I have two questions from the audience, but let's start with this one, which goes back to um, the climate solutions. What needs to change for commercial banks and governments to invest in climate solutions? Who wants to take that? Who do you want to do that? What you don't know is we're going to do business together. We do because business together. What you don't know yet, uh, because we're in the same place. Can I, can I just say something about, yeah. complement what was said also before, and then maybe uh, give my contribution to this question. Uh, when we look at the title, Impact Investment in Africa, we're talking from Africans or uh, anybody else that wants to invest in Africa. That, that would be maybe the first question. Uh, when we see more than remittances, well, foreigners don't send remittances. Only nationals from that country normally send remittances because this is where their family is. So I took the question from, how Africans can also impact investing. And one thing that we've noticed, uh, that I've noticed 20 years working in this in this field, so sorry about, is your off? I don't know, there's echo. Uh, if it's very annoying, I'll rather shout. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Um, I almost never see uh, the the issue the, the issue about diaspora groups being offered the mechanism, the services, so they can do it, uh, and they're the biggest investors yet. If the diasporas are brought together were considered a country, they would bump somebody out of the G8, the G7. They would bump it, and if it was the African diaspora, they would bump somebody from the G20. This is how big. It is. This is how their contribution, be it from remittances, which, by the way, the part of remittances that is invested in climate adaptation dwarfs everything else that is done in climate adaptation in Africa today. Agriculture, four times. That little tiny piece of the $200 that is invested by recipients in agriculture dwarfs four times global, uh, um, actually, in, in the global, global ODA to agriculture. So that gives you a little bit of a perspective that peanuts, Aggregated, it dwarfs everything else. Aid, and, and, and the list is long, and you can challenge me, and I give you the figures. So th this is how powerful th this this is, and, and it is the power is in the aggregation. I agree with uh, what is needed. Are we looking when we're talking about diaspora investor? Are we looking at the C-suite, the the investors, um, angel investors that can just drop a hundred and fifty thousand dollars? Because if I'm telling you that the diaspora investors that we see Malian one in France right now would like to invest $20, and they would like to contribute to that, I'm sure you start thinking, well, this is what they're doing right now. And we're putting mechanisms with crowdfunding where that 20 bucks makes a big difference, and we saw that during COVID. Mm -hmm. So are we looking into addressing that reality from mechanisms that allow you to invest 20 bucks or a million bucks? Uh, but all this mechanism is what is missing. Uh, I really appreciate, I don't disagree with anyone. I think everyone is right in a way because it is relevant. It is about the Africans, that relevance that you mentioned, absolutely. Uh, many want to invest in, uh, we were discussing, in Ghana yeah. because it's my own country. I might be interested in Africa next and maybe Southeast Asia, maybe later on if I'm just thinking about money, but my connection is with my country, in this case, yeah. Ghana. Yeah. So I think what, what you were mentioning is Yes, the context, they understand the context, they understand the risk, but there's also a very big lack of knowledge, and this is where there's need help. They do everything part-time. They have a full-time job, like your, your new friend has a full-time job, he wants to invest, he needs to learn how to do it, he's gonna take risk, he's gonna lose thousands of dollars maybe in the process. That should not happen. And there should be a lot of support from governments, of course, their own government, but also hosts that are interested in, in supporting this. This is basically the contribution that I wanted to, to give, but on climate, uh, I would like to, to illustrate many examples where uh, it is unknown, again, for a lot of the diaspora that is investing or, cre or supporting um, small and medium-sized enterprises in their community of origin, and they're really bringing this, this notion now of climate resilience to it. They really understand, and we have fantastic projects that showcase this in Somalia, in all places where access to water is a, pre is a problem, invasive pests. 
and this not only remittances have been addressing this, but also impact investment. So the, the knowledge that it is also uh, coming across from the, in the case of Africa, from African entrepreneurs here that, or those that send remittances is, are you thinking about the access to water? Are you thinking about solar energy? Yes, tell me. So th this is happening right now, but it is not, the, the, the flow is, is not as efficient as we, the, as we would like. And, and this a lot could be, could be done in that regard. And so what I'm hearing from you is that the remittances or the flows from private citizens are addressing some of these climate challenges. But I think what, I don't know who wrote the question, it's about how can we incentivize the banks and the governments to, you want to elaborate on the question? Can I share? If you, oh, do you want to? Yeah, you can go on. Yeah. Over. Okay. I think if you think about getting anyone to do anything, it's incentives. Um, and I think this is also the conversation around the fact that Africa is not a silo. If you look at Europe and how these incentives are forming and morphing, it's the emergence of some quasi regulation, not yet, but soon. Um, it's the systems to tracking certain data. It's the systems to reporting. If you think about how the world is organized around the climate emergency, um, and permit me to be frank, we talk a lot, we say many things, but if you think about a commercial entity that was built on the foundations of capitalism, you either incentivize either the carrot or a stick. And you could use policies and incentives like tax rebates, um, whatever. But if those incentives don't exist, people won't do it. And I have a personal philosophy. If you don't measure it, you don't mean it. We talk about all these things, but if you cannot see, if you cannot track, you cannot measure, you cannot even set a goal. I do believe that this is where policy can come in and play a very active role into creating the incentives on both sides to getting us to a place where at least we're visible. <laughs> Um, and then, you know, people can then benefit from those incentives. I would say that it's either, it's, it's, that's, that's the way. But then the one thought I would say we should potentially think about is the fact that, and this is how I see climate sustainability equity, it is an inevitable context for the world of tomorrow. Sooner or later, if you look at the evolution of our value systems in the global landscape, it's shifting not just from financial, solely financial, to other forms of value. It's we care about the environment. Um, it's, it's getting worse. Okay, we need to keep doing something about it. It's we don't want just 1% of VC to go to black, pe um, to black people or women. It's we are, you know, as a a civilization hinting that beyond the financial, there are other things that matter. And I think we need to evolve to that. One of the things that I've seen um, across Europe more is the B Corp, the idea of a B Corp. Um, I do think that if you think of capitalism, the thing was historically the shareholders, right? But now we're getting nuance. It's not just the shareholders, it's the environment. This has been a system that we've used for hundreds, thousands, or whatever of years. For us to move, we will have to rethink how we think of an organization, what is value, what we report. And I think policy is a, is a huge um, part of that debate as well. Yeah. yeah let me just give uh, two examples, like from Ghana. So the gov two things. So the government set up uh, a first loss guarantee scheme called GESAL. So all ag investments that banks make into farmers and agribusinesses, they take up to 50% first loss. And that has accelerated a lot of like financing into agriculture, right? Like in the past, uh, banks were not investing. I've had meetings with everyone. They were not investing. Now, APSA, Ecobank, they've all deployed a million dollars each all of our balance sheet directly to farm associations and farm groups because of that first loss guarantee. Second, also um, in development organizations also played a big role. So in Mastercard Foundation, also uh, you know set up a, a scheme that actually um, reduced the you know cost of lending below the you know the reference rate to give opportunity to smaller farm groups to also start their financial journey. So the interest rate dropped from 36% to 10%. And they can get up to like a million CDs, which is like $100,000 per, per group. The, obviously, this is not going to be forever. This is heavily subsidized. But the plan is to get those small former groups to actually start their financial journey 
um, make it, make some money, and be ready to take market rate, right? So those are like two examples that we've seen um, uh, in the country. And then there's one more coming up in 2024 where the government is going to be passing, like, you know, the central bank is going to be doing something where um, it's going to be People, banks will be using more alternative data. It's going to be more official where they will use alternative agricultural data to underwrite. This already happens in the West where you can get a credit card without any collateral. And there's a lot of information in agriculture. Like, for instance, like cocoa, we, we sell about you know, $2 billion out of cocoa every year as a country. Uh, you know, and that comes from farmers and farmer groups. All that transaction is there. If it is digitized, banks, banks can lend on that because that gives you an idea of the cash flow um, and then the risk profile of a, of a farmer and then, and then an agribusiness. There's, so there's all these examples that are coming up um, that, uh, you know, it is, that is, you know, accelerating more financing into agriculture. And hopefully the work that, you know, you guys are doing as well, IFAD, uh, that you're doing in Ghana as well. I just want to compliment on one thing. Uh, and when you hear remittances, you think money, grab, exactly what you just mentioned is the private companies, banks today, are basically seeing the potential for that. I mentioned credit history before to, to, to connect, uh, so you can connect to it. But this is what for banks uh, is, the, is the real opportunity, is getting through that, the, the fact that they receive remittances, a connection with these remittance families. And, and through that, they can get access to credit. Now, a lot of financial institutions here are also trying to say so the, the credit, if it is for farm, this is basically what projects that we're doing, uh, to make sure that it is climate resilient, yeah. for instance, or products. And there's incentives for that, be it for the carrot and without the, with, with the stick, but it works. So th these are the small little changes. And, and again, remittances is the vehicle that allows you to, to get into that. It's not about the money, it's about the opportunity. And answering the question, what needs to be done? It's, uh, I, I think is the mindset that just needs to be changed. Mindset starting from the entrepreneur, from the migrant, from the remitter, the recipient, and, and, and from the governments. There's a mindset that needs to change, but it's a slight change. And, but it's done across the board, it will work. Yeah, I, I think one thing that I often see people on the ground miss when they're talking about engaging governments and banks is that at the end of the day, you know, bottom line is key. And I'll tell you, you know, we, we invest um, in, in some things. We don't call it climate because, you know, we, we think about it as sustainability at scale. Um, and, you know, we've just had an explosion in solar. Um, and, and all it took was government to stop sus subsidizing petrol. I think. And and that was that probably is responsible for, you know, the you know, almost double like triple digits adoption in Nigeria, uh, more than any other fund impact all that stuff billions of dollars spent none of it mattered until the government stopped subsidizing petrol, <laughs> and so I I think sometimes we ignore low-hanging fruit that actually moves people because, you know, we want to speak a lot of English. And the truth of the matter is, look, most of, these most of these governments don't have capacity to enforce policy. So, you know, leaning on that is going to be very difficult. So I just want us to maybe go back to the drawing board. Uh, climate resiliency might be the goal, but thinking about it slightly differently and trying to tie it to people's personal bottom lines, either increasing income or lowering their cost might be a better strategy. Another question from, from the audience. For the past two years, is this better? Okay. For the past two years, I've been trying to raise capital for a portfolio of diagnostic manufacturers in Africa. Investors ask, what is the demand for African manufactured products? Unfortunately, demand is not there yet, or is not, not yet high, which minimizes ROI. What can be done to bridge this gap? Did I get the question right? Uh, that's actually an area where we invest. And the mindset actually is sell outcomes, don't sell devices. 
um, the the challenge with manufacturing um, is that the cost of capital um, for each of these things will bankrupt any local um, healthcare facility, and we we can't afford to buy the devices. And so, you know, we have a business, for example, called MDAS. Uh, medical devices as a service, which is literally what it means. And they own the third largest network of diagnostic um, clinics across uh, uh, the country in Nigeria. Um, very inching towards number one. And um, the, the reality of that business is they just sell outcomes. People come in every day, they get their test. And from the money for the test, they get a little bit goes to the manufacturer, right? And now we just have to look for capital to finance the devices as opposed to uh, look for, uh, you know, money to buy the devices, which greatly changes the, the income, the cost and income and distribution profile. So that would be my advice is for that person to look much more closely into selling outcomes and not selling... Uh, the devices themselves. Just to provide an example, going back to the diaspora is nostalgic trade, and uh, basically uh, this is what you found. You know, uh, while you're abroad, that they don't sell, but you had home, and uh, of those two hundred million that are far away from home, this is big business. You name one country, and they will have. Uh, this type of, of things, but some of this nostalgic trade for some are not. I have the example of Mexico, nopal, you know, this big cactus. Well, you do everything out of that. If you're Mexican, you will know that. Uh, you might not know, you know, from, from Nigeria, but in the case of, of the Mexicans, they really found that. And as I remember in my previous life working at Inter-American Development Bank, we did a project uh, to support this, the, the farming of, of nopal, and to make sure that they could be exported to the to the U.S., get all the ISO certification, et cetera, et cetera. Why? Because the migrant, the, the husbands had left to Chicago for the meatpacking. Uh, their wives stayed. Then they were receiving the money, but they decided to take over the no-pal plantation, and that's it. So with this help, they started basic, basically uh, producing and exporting because they realized that all the Mexicans in this particular case in, 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 in Chicago really wanted to that. You create anything out of that. That's it. Uh, and they would sell it five, five times more than they, would, uh, they, could, um, they could sell it in, in, in Mexico. That's it. That's one an example. Somalia, we, we did the same, the, same, uh, the, the same project. So again, this is just to say that maybe not the devices, but there's the local producers actually that also my work uh, in terms of, uh, of something that you can, uh, you can create. I have some thoughts about that. Uh, and even broader than, than that, I think that's one of the biggest weaknesses with um, um, the remittances um, landscape today, right? It's not appropriately aggregated. And, and actually, it's, it's, um, there's a lot of hidden cost. Um, part of which is this idea. But I think one of the things that a lot of very successful remittance companies have done is, is try to penetrate the communities through the groups, right, through the community groups and associations. However, I also think that we also as a continent maybe need a bit of sophistication around how we move the money and how to think about moving the money. So, for example... Um, many times we see, you know, 30 to 35 percent of the cost of, of the remittance kind of ends up in fees, right? Because of the quantum, um, the movement, the pricing, and all sorts of other things, right? And at the end of the day, um, it doesn't always necessarily help. And this is an area where central banks in particular can be more productively engaged in actually making sure that. You know, by the way, all the money you send home ends up in the bank account of the central bank. So it turns into actual currency back home. Um, and even though people don't like their governments, you know, at the end of the day, there are these central banking functions that that every country has. And they all, all that bank accounts and infrastructure sort of sits at JP Morgan Chase or one of these other big banks. 
And there's actually a big case for working more closely with those banks to say, since this money is going to the central bank, can you make sure that it's a bit cheaper? And that's one area of advocacy that a lot of um, diaspora could really pick up and global partners could actually take on in a practical way um, without trying to exploit anybody. The other thing is given, um, you know, we don't exploit America's, America's charity laws enough. America gives you back money for given. And everything you send to your family, properly structured, can be considered charitable given, especially when you're investing in social infrastructure for your community. And we find that a lot of these groups are not empowered or enabled um, to organize themselves properly um, to, to be able to make those types of uh, large-scale social investments um, with local organizations. And that's a big you know, potential area of innovation and impact. Um, like, for example, the Christian groups have something called the National Impact Foundation, and most of the money they send to Africa um, goes through that foundation, which has the ability to give you tax receipts, but is for benefit of charities all over. And there's no reason why you couldn't have something similar with respect to diaspora organizations. Um, I think I think the problem you raised is a very tough one because with diaspora, they're not necessarily aggregated in one place. The communities are fragmented. Go to market is very hard. But I do think that I have seen some interesting actually tech models that are launching products and digital nations, for example. And that might seem you know really flippant at the top of it, but ultimately their goal is actually to aggregate the diaspora. Um, and provide almost like a, an ubiquitous, like virtual um, access to these groups um, at enough depth that makes it the cost of acquisition lower as you go. So people are trying to solve the problem, but I think it's a problem nonetheless. And I think that um, without that problem being solved, we really won't be able to tap into the diaspora as a lumped unit of value creation, whatever way, um, because they are so spread out. Um, and to be honest, I do think that there is something to be said about, I guess, the demographic shift, about the emigration, about diaspora as a nation in and of itself. And it's being this extension of the continent to even penetrating, you know, the markets externally, not just the other way. I keep talking about the relevance of Africa both ways. I do think that there is um, some... I guess, um, world where the diaspora in and of itself is the go-to market for the larger, um, I guess, global opportunities. So yeah, but just to say that the problem is right, I think it's tough. No one solved it, but people are trying. Thank you. All right, so we have about five minutes and I'm gonna ask a question. I want each of you to answer it. I'm gonna situate the question um, in a sense of when we talk about impact investing, we're talking about social returns alongside financial returns, right? And so that we're also kind of thinking about the private sector, right? So the government or um, grants may not be looking for that financial return. They're looking for the, the social or environmental impact. And so really thinking about the private sector that needs to be incentivized to do something good with the financial returns what are some of the, what are the sectors that we should be watching? And there might be some investors here thinking about what are the sectors that we should be investing in where we can have a social and our environmental impact alongside healthy financial returns. And we've talked a little bit about agriculture, AI, and climate. What are some of the other sectors that you think um, we should be focused on? We'll start with you, Pedro. Is that all right? Yeah. Instead of the so uh, sectors, I would say the target groups. Uh, again, uh, we're talking about uh, big sector, uh, uh, you know, dropping a hundred thousand dollars or that fifty fifty dollars or thirty dollars. So, uh, I think that's how I would answer my question: is the target groups? It's very difficult to get the the, the diaspora. I think it was much more difficult twenty years ago with the internet and everything. It makes it much much easier. And I, we can give you some some of the tips, but I think. W we don't, particularly with digitalization today, and particularly since COVID, it's much more easier to identify and track and to bring that diaspora community back together. And then I don't understand it. It is not about the money. It is about who they are, their financial capability, 
I think is is what needs to be done, and then the needs. So then I would answer more is on, in sectors in rural areas. There's different opportunities than than in urban. When we're looking at the diaspora connected with rural areas, uh, it it really goes from any type of SME sort of investment. The surveys is gold in this field, and this is what we find in some surveys is to understand what not only diaspora wants but the recipients also want. And that gives you the answer to that. What is the sector? And they're pretty basic at the end of the day uh, for many of the rural populations that we are we are targeting. But before that, again, I would ask you what type of product or what type of target group rather than just the sector. And, and to answer to answer that, I think investors are more thinking about they want to get the highest financial returns alongside those social returns. So. Think about it in, in conjunction with we want to have so a large diaspora, impact. <laughs> but in reverse, diaspora investors, they first want to have a social impact, which is why they go and invest in that company. And then by return to the company payment. So it's just a, a reverse, but it's the same, the same, the same concept. But it does require a little bit of an adaptation. That's so food, invest in food, but you have to be a bit more patient. Um, <laughs> 2022, investors invested about $630 million into ag and food companies in Africa. 2023, that dropped to you know, $99 million for obvious reasons, right? Like a Greek is hard. It takes time. Uh, it's you know, heavily affected by many of the macros. Russia decides to invade Ukraine. Food prices go up. Fertilizer prices go up three times. Fuel prices go up. So it's really hard. Um, but, you know, there will be a lot of humans on the planet. No matter what is happening in the world, humans eat. They'll keep investing in food. So invest in food on the continent, but be very patient. Also invest in value addition. If you're thinking about areas to look at, think about cocoa. Uh, you know, Ghana and Ivory Coast, we export a lot of the raw cocoa. We don't process it. A lot of money to be made, a lot of impact to be made. Uh, cashew. Ivory Coast uh, is the largest exporter of uh, raw cashew nut. Uh, one million metric tons. Um, we export more of the raw than the processed. The processed adds more margin, more jobs are created, more money stays in the country. So invest in not just the growing, but in the processing as well. Um, there's a lot of money to be made, but you have to have like a long-term view, 10-year horizon, uh, if you want to create wealth that lasts in agric. Thanks. I would say invest in the future. OpenSea looks across future of commerce, work, and health. All three are very deliberately picked in the way the world is evolving. I think look for um, funds, projects, startups who align with your value to both create sustainable um, and financial impact. I think invest in value adding initiatives that scale. Invest in people with incredibly bright ideas of how they can create value and opportunity for people on the continent or globally via people from the continent. Um, I think that with this nuance, the one thing I would say is, and I know that this is probably not the panel to say, but some flexibility on the nuance on what impact means and really anchoring on the actual impact as opposed to the labeling and what it looks like. I think given the world that we live in, um, also investing in things that create more representation in the world. It's getting worse with technology. People are shaping the world and it's not looking like a representative of the world as well. So that would be my two cents. Um, mine would be very straightforward. Uh, services, um, export services specifically. Um, the reality of, of of um, the, the, the landscape in Africa is that there is a need for a lot of the currencies have devalued um, and there is a need for foreign exchange income um, and whether it's tradable services or non-tradable services um, if you invest in services many of these uh, um, um, money of the people are able to make a lot of money in, in US dollars the costs remain low but even then income increases because productivity increases. So you actually give people more income. Um, and so I like to say, you know, 
Think about whatever it is that Africans can do for you, preferably over the internet, because that requires a little bit less infrastructure, but just generally any kind of export services actually work out pretty well, financially and impact-wise. Well, thank you.